Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's here lurking around like a weirdo, and this is Stuff You Should Know. That's right. Uh, interstellar a dish. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And Chuck, I was like, surely we've talked about this before, and I'm sure we have, maybe in the Galaxy episode, or I think we did Black one on holes. the sun. Oh, was it Black Holes? Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. Um, but we've never done one, I double-checked, we've never done one on Supernovae. That's an A-E on the end. That's plural. Mm-hmm. Um, episode before. And we're going to now. And I I have to say the reason we're going to now, I think, for my money, is that we will be s- discussing probably the most interesting phenomenon in the universe. Oh, you think so? That's, that's my bet. Uh, you know, I'm not going to try to sway you or persuade you if you feel differently, but that's just how I feel. All right. Well, I mean, it's interesting timing because of the uh, the new images coming back from the James Webb Space Telescope. I know, man. Kind of like right now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it looks like this thing. I mean, it's a it's a thousand times greater than what Hubble can see. Yeah. And like Hubble is our our Gen X's superstar. Yeah, and it's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, it's produced some pretty amazing pictures, you know. It's fine, but it's nothing compared <laughs> to the James Webb. No. Uh, and what they're saying is that this thing is potentially uh, going to be able to see through space dust. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to be doing something that we uh, can often not do, which is see supernovae. Yeah, which is a big deal because, you know, space dust can really obscure supernovae, which we'll talk about. But, yeah, have you seen that? I, I'm sure you've seen that that first picture they released. The star child. Amazing. (laughs) Yeah, it is. But at the same time, it's almost like it looks like it was put together by a poorly trained graphic designer who like really overdid it, you know, tried to fit everything into one picture. But it just like really goes to show you how not so full the universe is. And yet imagine how spread out all that stuff is, the distance between those things. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. It is. Uh, And, you know, the core. uh Uh-huh. No, uh, no pun intended. Uh, but the core of this research comes from our old, our old website that we used to work for, howstuffworks.com. dot mm-hmm. And uh, one of the the most convoluted explanations of anything I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna pare it down to size. We're gonna tame it. Okay. It's um and hey, listen, I don't want to pick on somebody, but it almost seemed like the goal was. <laughs> To see how much they could confuse somebody about supernovae <laughs> instead know. of clearly explain what it what's going on there. So our goal is to <laughs> wind our way through this and uh, lean into kids' science websites like I always do. Okay, yep, and they work big time, especially for this kind of thing. Because um, to me, one of the reasons I find talking about a supernova so attractive is that it's really understandable when you – kind of like dig into it. But when you realize like, oh, I I get this stuff, you, you, you come to realize that like, you understand like the most superficial understanding of, of what's actually going on. And it's still like generally the nuts and bolts, the principle of it, but there's so much more detail that people, you know, um, dedicate their entire careers to studying these things. And we're just going to go over it in less than an hour. How about that? Well, yeah. And if you, uh, I say far less than an hour, but if you <laughs> if you look at what you're trying to understand, and even if you can understand like the tiniest concepts, what you're also understanding are the tiniest building blocks of everything, basically. Yeah, because out of supernovae are born uh, are are heavy elements, and without heavy elements, there is no life on Earth. Yeah, so like that saying that we're all made of stardust, it feels like a Sagan saying. Um, that's very true, and that stardust comes in large part from supernovae. Um, I thought so, it was Stephen Stills. <laughs> was it? I oh, yeah, so. you're right. But I think he <laughs> might have been smoking dubs with Carl Sagan at the time. Dubs? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what they called their words, not mine. Just to enshrine our Generation Xness of this whole thing? <laughs> that's right. It, it didn't say spliff, at least, right? Oh, that would be Gen X. I guess dubs would be more boomer. Right, exactly. 
So, so, but that's a, I mean, that's a really accurate statement, right? Everything, planets are made from it. Other stars are made from it. Um, anything alive on a planet, in Earth, as far as we know, um, is made of that same stuff that gets ejected from stars during supernovae. And if you if you study this, what we're talking about really is the end stage of the life cycle of a p- particular star. But if you follow it back beyond that that end point and, and watch that stardust and like kind of track it and trace it, you'll see that it goes to, on to form more stars. So really what we're looking at is a part of a cycle that very much resembles like the carbon cycle here on Earth, a closed system that is self-reinforcing and self-sustaining that goes over really, really long periods of time, but really it just keeps regenerating itself. Yeah, and the other cool thing about this Webb telescope is they're seeing already seeing just baby star factories out there. Yeah, uh, it's really cool stuff. Uh, I guess before we get into what is actually happening at the end life of a star, we should talk a little bit probably about just sort of how rare this is. Like, if, if you don't know anything about supernovae, you may think that um, this kind of thing is happening all the time in the Milky Way galaxy, and we may not see it because of space dust and stuff, but uh, it is, in fact, happening all over the place all the time, all over many, many galaxies. But in the Milky Way galaxy, it happens about every 50 years or so, give or take. Mm -hmm. Uh, They track about, you know, two every hundred years. And by track, like I said, sometimes they don't see them. And up until the mid-2000s, they thought that the last one in the Milky Way was in the 1600s. And then they realize, hey, wait a minute. We've been following other things like this this debris, this interstellar debris, and that's actually the remnants of a supernova just about 140 years old. We just didn't know that's what it was. Right, exactly. Until later. The one that they thought was the, the last one from the 1600s was described by um, Johann Kepler, who spotted it, and it's now called SN 60, 1604, Supernova 1604, because that's when it happened. Um, and that was discovered by Kepler because it was visible to the to the naked eye. And there have only been five recorded supernovae in the last millennia that were visible to the naked eye. Um, one in 1006, one in 1054, one in 1181, one in 1572, and then Kepler's in 1604. So the very ironic thing is that since we invented telescopes, there hasn't been a supernova that was visible to the naked eye, which is kind of funny. Yeah, but you can see them with a telescope that you or I could own. Um, Right. In fact, the the high-powered telescopes, sometimes they're so sensitive to this, you know, as you'll see, the supernovae um, emit a super bright light, as you would imagine, when a star collapses and explodes mm-hmm. upon itself. And sometimes those telescopes, in fact, they're almost always overwhelmed and not very useful for those purposes. So uh, they count on regular people in their telescopes sometimes to see these in neighboring galaxies, like uh, that 10-year-old girl in 2011 that found one uh, 240 million light years away. Mm-hmm. Uh, in January of, of 2011, and it's 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 cool that they actually uh, kind of depend on amateur astronomers to find these things, to call them in to the uh, the AI, the yeah, the IAU Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams. Sounds like mm-hmm. something Dan Aykroyd would spit out in an infomercial, right? And they only accept telegrams. They, yeah, that's right. You have to wire <laughs> to them. Are you going to tell me to stop again? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you can submit that and they will take a look and they will use their uh, spectrometers to kind of see what radiation is being given off. And then they can tell a lot about what's going on. Yeah, big time. Um, and the reason that they there's a couple of reasons they they rely on those backyard astronomers. One. Uh, Amateur astronomers are no joke. They know what they're doing. They also have plenty of very well-documented star charts. So they're exactly the kind of people who, number one, are looking up at the skies in the first place. And then number two, are familiar enough with what the sky is supposed to look like that they would actually notice a new star. That's the deal. So it actually is a thing that amateur astronomers are relied on by professional astronomers. And the coolest thing about this, too, is, is as we'll see, like a supernova, when it shows up, it can it can be a new star that shines for a day, a couple weeks, a few months, usually not much longer than that. And then it just goes away again. And what's really neat about this is what you're seeing 
is an event that happened 25 million years ago. And yeah. finally, that light that's, uh, you know, 25 million light years away from us, that where, where it originated, is finally reaching us. I just find that so colossally awesome. And I know that applies to every bit of starlight and even sunshine. It's not like it's instantaneous. It takes, you know, light years to, to reach us, or it has to travel across light years to reach us. But for some reason, the idea that, it, that, that that's the basis of a supernovae is, is really neat to me. Yeah, and in fact, the very first one on record was uh, about 2,000 years ago in China. Mm -hmm. There were astronomers there who um, all of a sudden saw a new light like you would today, and they started following it and making notes and chronicling the, you know, what this thing was doing there. And then I think it took about eight months in that case, uh, which is pretty long. So maybe, sure. I don't know, maybe they were off or something. I mean, this was... 2000 years ago. No, I mean they were the Chinese astronomers of this age were pretty they were pretty sharp. So they would have they would have probably been pretty accurate. Well, at any rate, it disappeared and they quite uh, didn't quite understand like what was going right. on at the time. Right, but they did write it down in a book a couple centuries later called the um the book of the later Han, as in the Han dynasty. And I guess at some point somebody came across this and realized that what they were describing was a supernova. And what's even more mind-blowing about it is we've reached the, the point where using things like spectrographs and, and other, um, like, incredibly sensitive telescopes, we can um, look at the remnants and see what they're made of, how hot they are, how fast they're traveling, and basically reverse engineer their origin to determine how old something is. And they've actually found that supernova, supernova 186, that was originally described in the by the um, Han astronomers. Yeah, and we'll get to why it's useful to chart this stuff anyway, because it's not, I mean, you might think, you know, it's a dead or dying and dead star, like who cares? Uh, but it can be very useful as far as mapping the universe and uh, finding out what how things behave in neighboring galaxies. And it's all super useful. And, of course, we've already talked about the elemental factor, which is why we're here. That's right. As humans, so it, not us. Right, exactly. Um, and I think the last one that was visible, not to the naked eye, I think you had to use binoculars, was um, SN 1987. Yeah. And um, that one was outside of our galaxy. It was uh, technically, it came from the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a dwarf satellite galaxy to the Milky Way. So again, it wasn't it wasn't one of those fifty that happen every year in the Milky Way. It was outside of it, but you could kind of see it, and it was a big deal because it, uh, by about that time we were starting to get just enough advance to like really start to make hay out of the data that we were getting from it. So it was pretty cool. But wasn't that one a, a two banger? Didn't that one rear its head again in twenty eleven? Um, so what they figured out, and this will make more sense once we explain what, how like an actual supernova works, but the the um, initial, the secondary explosion, like you said, the double banger, I think that's actually the technical term. <laughs> the second explosion caught up with the material from the first explosion right. and interacted, released a ton of energy, and it actually brightened. So, yeah, just from tracking this stuff, I think they were like, we didn't know that could do that. And just from watching SN 1987, they learned something new. Yeah, 24 years later, which is really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Should we take a break? Uh, yeah, I think so. All right. You seem hesitant. Well, I do want to throw in one more thing since we're talking about these things and seeing them with the naked eye. One of the reasons why you can see them with the naked eye is because these things are so bright. Some of them outshine entire galaxies for the time that they're shining. And they, they'd be brighter than the full moon here on Earth and so bright that you could actually see them during full daylight, too. So that's pretty bright. That's quite bright. OK, now I'm ready, Chuck. All right. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the types of... Uh, two types of supernovae right after this and try and make some sense out of all this stuff.
Okay. So if you want to break down the types of supernovae, you don't have to work very hard because there are two types. Uh, and then there are some <laughs> subtypes we'll get into. But uh, these were first classified in 1941 by an astronomer named Rudolf Minkowski. And like we said, they use uh, spectrographs to get a, a good picture of what is going on inside of a, a burning star because they can look at their their color lines, their absorption lines. And if we start at the beginning, we have type 1 supernovae that have absorption lines that indicate that they don't have hydrogen. Which is and weird. And they're super, super bright, but for a very short amount of time, type 1. Right. And then type 2 do have hydrogen, full stop. That's right. <laughs> but then they they started, this is, um, uh, Minkowski was working in the 40s, like you said. So as time went by and we got better and better at observing the, the universe, by the 80s, they were like, we could subdivide these even further. So you've got the type 1A, type 1B, type 1C, and then type 2. And type 1A is totally its own animal. We'll talk about it in a second. But type 1B, 1C, and type 2 they generally undergo the same colossal kind of explosion, but the big difference is they have like different kinds of um, elements in them or they don't. Um, that's really the only different difference that I can see, and it really doesn't make much difference for what we're going to talk about. Right. Uh, so the one I was mentioning when I said type 1 are very bright for a very short amount of time. It's actually 1A mm -hmm. uh, more specifically. And they happen basically when a white dwarf star – uh, orbits a bigger star. It's got to be orbiting another star because what it's going to do is suck matter off of that big star uh, until it gets to basically boom size. Exactly. And they actually have figured out, uh, well, I should say Dr. Chandraskar figured it out, um, the the exact amount and moment where the the um, mass and the matter that it's sucked off of the other star reaches that boom level. And it's called the Chandraskar limit. And it equals basically 1.4 solar masses. And it'll probably surprise no one that a solar mass is a mass equal to our sun. And a white dwarf might start out as less than that. But once it sucks enough matter off of its twin star in that binary system, it will hit that limit, and all of a sudden, a uh, thermonuclear reaction happens, a, a chain reaction exactly like the kind that happens in a thermonuclear bomb. Um, and that runaway chain reaction actually blows the star to smithereens, as Yosemite Sam would put it. <laughs> uh, that's right. And, uh, you know, let me jump back a sec because I think it's it helps to understand kind of what's going on at the core of these stars anyway. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a, a massive star, it, it is burning – just huge, huge amounts of that nuclear fuel at the core. And that produces a ton of energy and obviously is going to be really, really hot. Uh, the same kind of thing like when we talked about our nuclear fusion uh, for nuclear power and stuff like that. The same mm -hmm. kind of thing is going on. Right. Uh, but that's going to generate a ton of pressure. And a star is basically a balancing act. You have two forces that are kind of keeping one another in check because the star always has – this gravity that's trying to squeeze it down to the smallest, you know, possible size. Right. But then you have this nuclear reaction going on, creating all this pressure going out. And it's that outward push kind of battling against the inward squeeze of gravity that keeps a star from – that keeps this from happening all the time. Uh, and when it finally does run out of that fuel, which we'll talk about kind of how that happens, it's going to cool off and that causes that pressure to drop – Gravity wins, and then you've got your Big Bang. Not yeah. the Big Bang, but a Big Bang. <laughs> right. And that's that's the Type 2 supernovae that you, you talked about. But both stars, Type 1A and Type 2, they will they, they burn um, hydrogen and turn it into helium. And the same process goes. It's just what happens after they run out of fuel is the big difference between them, right? Well, yeah, but is the running out of fuel basically is it working its way through the elemental chart, right? Creating all these different elements until it gets to iron and nickel. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. Stars burn hydrogen. They, as they burn hydrogen, it fuses into helium. Helium's heavier, so it actually starts to settle more toward the core because of that 
um, that gravity because gravity can exert a stronger force on something with more mass, and helium has more mass than than hydrogen. So the hydrogen kind of stays in the outer layers of the star, and the core is made up of helium. Well, as that hydrogen starts to wear out, the core starts burning off the helium, like using that to keep itself going as fuel. And then eventually it starts fusing it into heavier and heavier elements, like you were saying. And it's all fine. It's all good. I mean, it's getting a little panicky. The star's like got that cartoon sweat jumping off its forehead. Mm -hmm. But it's still producing more energy than it's using so it can keep that that gravity at bay, although it's getting harder and harder, right? And then, like you said, once it starts producing iron, it reaches the point where there's a net energy loss because it takes more energy to combine uh, uh, molecules into iron than the energy that's released from that process. And that, my friend, is where the star starts to go boom. Yeah, and here's the part I don't quite get. Maybe you can help me. Is uh, I know that's how a, a type two works, but does a type one A do the same thing, but just by sucking in matter from its neighbor? No, no. Okay, no. A type one A blows up like a nuclear bomb. Okay, I got you. It just it's sets just, off that chain reaction, and it just blows itself up. All right. The other way that a type 1A can go out is if it has, so it's got to reach that Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses, and then that chain reaction happens. If that star never reaches that limit, um, but it runs out of fuel, it'll go from a white dwarf to a black dwarf. And a black dwarf is basically like a star that's a campfire that you stopped adding wood to, and it eventually just gets dimmer and dimmer, and then it finally goes out on its own. That's basically a, a black dwarf. Okay. All right. Well, that, make, that makes sense then. Yeah. Because it's basically uh, fusing all, all of the carbon and everything, like, at that core, and it just it can't handle that kind of load the type two you mean the, no the type one uh uh no i think it just runs out of fuel and becomes a black dwarf or if it has enough fuel no i mean it, to go boom okay yeah it has it has enough fuel that it, it yes i i don't know if it's carbon or if it's hydrogen or whatever but it, it has enough of whatever it needs to um set off that runaway thermonuclear chain reaction and blow itself up i think it's carbon Okay, so yeah, and that would make sense. Um, but it's so it turns into a thermonuclear carbon bomb, a star-sized version. That's what happens with the Type One A. The Type Two, and this is the whole reason it's different, Chuck. Is the Type Two star starts out as much larger, much more massive than a Type One um, A star, right? Yeah, like eight x the sun. Yes, exactly. And so uh, yeah, it has to be at least that t that size or else it's not going to work. It'll probably turn into a, um, the type 1A kind of supernovae. Um, so because it's eight times the size or the mass of the sun, it has a really strong gravitational force working on it. And then that is what really plays that major role in a type 2 supernovae, that gravity sucking everything in toward the core. And then the denser and more massive the core is because more stuff is getting sucked into it and more and more iron is being put together, that that is what makes it implode with such force that it actually explodes with, I would guess, an equal amount of force. Yeah, like it collapses in on itself, and once it gets to the center, it has nowhere to go but back out, right? Yeah, exactly. And there's like a lot of details to it where like um, as stuff is getting sucked into the center, the, it hits that core, and it's traveling. Those particles are traveling so fast. Like, you know how uh, um, uh, like a piece of space dust can like go right through a satellite? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, t that's this on steroids, um, or this is that on steroids. It's pulling those particles toward the core, and when they hit it, they bounce off. They release a shock wave, and that actually explodes. It starts exploding against itself. And then at the same time, the pressure from gravity exerted on the core is so great that those iron um, atoms actually get squeezed together so tightly that the protons and electrons get fused into neutrons, and the 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 solar mass can go from something like, you know, 5,000 miles in diameter down to 12 miles in diameter. And again, this is something I don't think we pointed out yet, so I probably shouldn't say again, Chuck. All of this is happening in less than a second. 
yeah, the 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 end game happens very very fast. Yeah, after you know a ten billion plus life, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you know, really burning out instead of fading away. Not to get too <laughs> corny there, but uh, if you look at a one A when that thing explodes, it's going to create a ton of iron being blasted out because of that heat. It's going to be very symmetrical, and they actually use that because they're so. Um, sort of consistent in that they the one A's all explode at the same time uh, in their death, and they peak with that same brightness. They use that, and it's it's called the standard candle, and it's I think it's just basically sort of like a baseline measurement, right? Yeah, they can use it to uh, as a measurement against um, other stuff in the neighborhood to figure out how bright those things are, what they're made of, how old they are, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I, that's it's pretty cool. You wouldn't think about it, but it, it does make sense that since they all follow the same process at the same time, totally. Are we due for a break or no? Yeah, I think we have, Chuck. All right. Uh, we're going to come back, and I don't even know what we're going to talk about, so that'll be very exciting for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> What's left? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's a lot left, which is pretty neat. So um, we, we've we learned a lot from supernovae. Uh, and just by studying them, we start finding things out that there's like a lot of caveats to what we just said. Not everything follows the exact same process, with the exception of those type 1A that, that become standard candles because they, they follow such a, a specific roadmap. But the type 2A are a little more chaotic um, than than what we thought before. And that's evidence from a supernova that was discovered in 2006 that um, is named SNLS-03C3BB, right? Is that is that the one they nicknamed Champagne Supernova? Yes, because it was 2006. <laughs> Were you into Oasis? No. Or, or Britpop at all? Yeah, I like Britpop, but I like more 80s Britpop, like um, that whole uh, like 24-hour party people era. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I'm not dogging on anything else. I'm holding my tongue, holding my tongue. No, no, I wasn't I wasn't an Oasis fan, although I, there's a couple of the songs I really liked, but mm-hmm. that was an era for me where I think I was just listening to other stuff. Um mm-hmm. Emily was really into that era of Britpop though. She was she she liked that stuff. Nice. And it, it's fine. Every time, you know, she puts on a little Britpop mix, it's fine. What else is she listening to from that era? Like uh Verb? Who? Verve, that bittersweet symphony. Yeah, I think a little bit of um, early only Coldplay. Hmm. Uh, it, it's it's almost like it's. I don't. Know, it seems very uncool to even mention Coldplay now. <laughs> yeah, you Am might want to edit that out. <laughs> but I think those first couple of albums she liked. Uh, uh, who else? It seems like there were some other Britpop bands. I'm just not thinking about. I'm sure there's plenty others for sure. I mean, I'd. We can just talk about Britpop for the rest of the episode. No, no, no. We've got to go back to Supernova <laughs> and specifically the Champagne Supernova from 2006. Right. Uh, Blur, that's another one. Okay, yeah, yeah. Blur's great. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, the Doves, she liked them. I never... Oh, yeah. I like them too, actually. I didn't realize they were Britpop. Yeah, I think... Uh, I mean, not not as Brit Poppy as like Travis and stuff like that, but okay, yeah, I like those Dubs albums. Those those were good. Yeah, they really were good. They're definitely an overlooked group. Uh, all right, so they called this one the Champagne Supernova in two thousand six. S N L S zero three. You already said it. I know, but it's fun <laughs> to say. Uh, but this one was uh, this one kind of rocked everyone's world because it was only, or not only, it extended up to two times solar mass and it exceeded that uh chandra's car limit which was 1.4 previously Mm -hmm. and we thought that was that was it like it couldn't go any higher and it turned it not to 11 but to two yeah and so it not only um contradicted the the then understanding of type 1a supernovae it contradicted something i said not 10 minutes ago 
Well, and does that mean that's now just thrown out forever and like anything can happen? Or no. is it still generally 1.4? I would guess it's generally generally 1.4 because I don't think they made it up. I think the math suggested it. Now right. they just have to figure out like how to adjust the math to include this anomaly. And that's actually physicists love that stuff. Like the whole reason they're running the Large Hadron Collider is because they're trying to create stuff that they've never seen before so that yeah. they can figure out how it works. Right. Um, they've reached the levels of, of theory and now need like more data, and that's what they're doing. So when they come across more data like this in the field of astronomy, I'm pretty sure it's the exact same thing. They're like, yes, this is a total anomaly, and now we're going to have a better understanding once we figure out how this thing fits into our current understanding. Keen, that was another Britpop band. They were Remember okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the, they were the one from the Lake House with Keanu and Sandra Bullock, that song. Um, oh, I, I never saw that. Emily watches that movie over and over just because of the house. That Oh, it's a great house. But also the tree part is really amazing too. I love it. It's a great I never movie saw too. it. It but is Emily, worth watching. She will watch uh, bad movies for architecture alone over and over. Okay, but I suspect she also probably likes that movie because it's pretty good. Just bring I your Kleenex know. if you sit down and watch All it. All right, I'll have, to, I'll have to ask her. It's a good one. Anything Keanu Reeves does is great. For sure. Well, Love that guy. Okay. Hey, he's hey, listen. Great. He's great in everything. I'll say that. How about that? I mean, just a great human. I like that guy. Sure, yeah. Um. All right, so where are we? I've wasted enough time. <laughs> okay, here's where we get to another really interesting part, Okay. The type 2 supernovae can produce a couple of different outcomes, and it depends on the size of the star when it's at its main sequence, which is that those billions of years that it's burning, it's, it, it reaches its adult size. And if a type 2 star has a size that's greater than 40 solar masses, has a mass 40 times our own sun or more, when that thing goes off, when it reaches the end of its life, and that core collapse happens, it will um, actually turn into a black hole. It gets sucked so thoroughly into itself that it basically goes, boop, and becomes a black hole. Well, and because, that's another reason we might not see it, right? Yes, but that's why some supernovae kind of like flicker for a second and then go out. Right. And that you just, you know that it was a greater than 40 solar bodies um, mass star that just underwent supernova. Um, wow. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Because all that same stuff that's going on that creates that collapse doesn't let the explosion happen. The force of gravity is so great because this thing is so massive that it doesn't let it escape. And it, it eventually just sucks itself into a black hole. The other way it can go, which for my money is equally interesting, is if it has a, a, a mass of less than 40 solar bodies, it'll become a neutron star. So that core sticks around. Remember I said it can go from a 5,000-mile diameter star down to a 12-mile diameter in a second? Yeah. That 12-mile diameter core can stick around, and that's what's called a neutron star. And one of the cool things about neutron stars is that sometimes they spin. And when they spin, they're putting off so much energy that they release a flash of light on a really regular schedule. And those are what's called pulsars. That's right. And that's... I know we've talked about pulsars before. Surely we have before, too. But there's one in particular. Did you see that one that's the fastest spinning pulsar in the universe? Uh, do you mean PSR J1748-2446 AD? The one and only. <laughs> do they have a cool name for that one? I don't think so. I didn't see it. I think they think that's a cool name for it. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, that, is that the kind of people we're dealing with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is 16 kilometers in di diameter, which... Uh, it sounds big, but as far as stars go, it's not that big, right? No, because, I mean, like, it's the size of a an American city, you know, the downtown part of it, and the, but it's the same mass or greater of our own sun, up to 40 times the mass of our own sun, but in that small of a package. That's dense, baby. Yeah, it is. Uh, this thing is really cooking, though. It's uh, spinning at about 716 times per second, which is an equivalent of... Uh, close to 43,000 RPMs. Yeah. So imagine downtown Los Angeles spinning mm. 716 times per second out there in outer space. Sometimes it feels like that. Am I right? Yeah, LA? totally. Especially <laughs> after a long night. Uh, if all this sounds potentially dangerous, you know, as far as us here on Earth, 
Um, it would be super dangerous if there was one that exploded uh, close to Earth. It would be very huge, first of all. There would be all kinds of uh, gnarly radiation that would not be good for us. Oh, yeah. However, um, it has to be a really, really, really big star to explode as a supernova. And we know what's out there right now, and there aren't any stars that are nearly close enough. It would be millions of years uh, for a star close enough to us to be big enough to become a supernova. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about it. But there, it has happened in the past. There are traces of past supernovae here on Earth, uh, in particular um, radioactive iron 60, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't think it's a open and shut case, but it's a it's a really good indicator that there was there's supernova debris um, just buried down there on the seafloor. Yeah, and they're trying to correlate it with some of the mass extinctions that took place in Earth's history. And they think that maybe, you know, oh, it didn't like blow, you know, the mastodon off of its feet and put it in extinction. But instead, it, it might have had a real effect on the ozone layer, which allowed more UV than normal through, which could have triggered a, a, a climate change that led to a mass extinction. Well, they say it does at least correspond uh, close to the beginning of the Pleistocene Ice Age. So, right. I don't think they've said like that's the cause, but uh, I don't know. Couldn't have, couldn't have helped. For it to be like a, a genuinely planet sterilizing event, though, <clears throat> it would have to be within 100 to 150 light years. Um, or no, 50 light years. And the closest one that could go supernova is 1K Pegasus, and it's 150 light years away. So like you said, we're not, we're not in any kind of danger. And our sun will never go supernova because it's not um, – eight solar masses and it's not going to reach 1.4 solar masses because it's not a part of a binary star and obviously it's one solar mass because the solar mass is equal to our sun's mass i think planet sterilizing event should be our Britpop album title i think uh, yes i couldn't agree more it's not very brit poppy but it, we could push the boundaries Sure. As long as, like, we're wearing white jeans that are pegged with black patent leather shoes on the cover, <laughs> it doesn't matter what we name it. Did we do this one? One more thing. There's such things as zombie stars. Ooh. This is a new thing that they figured out in the last few years that's a, an, an anomaly that we don't understand. But they're basically stars that undergo supernova multiple times. Doesn't really make much sense, but uh, they are starting to figure that out. And it's not the case of, uh, like, the one in uh, 87 and 2011? Not that I know of, no, because it, 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 would, it would only hit its, you know, ejecta once, as far as I can tell. This is, like, like at least five or six times that they've found this one zombie star to have gone supernova. Interesting. Yeah, I think so, too. And so Maybe that's the name of our Britpop band. What, Zombie Star? Yeah. That Zombie Star... Planet sterilizing event. I think, yeah. We're onto something might be here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Although diarrhea planet could use planet <laughs> oh. sterilizing event. And oh, that man. would be a great album for them. I'm sure if this has gotten back to those guys, they're like, why didn't you talk about us this much while we were still together? <laughs> right. Maybe we can get a reunion going. Stadium tour. I would go. Uh, totally. Um, but yeah, Zombie Star is a great name for our Brit pop band. I agree. All right. Well, if we accomplished anything, it's that. Yeah. I think we accomplished more than that, Chuck. And since I said that, uh, I want to direct everybody to the How Stuff Works article, How a Supernova Works. Clearly, they hedged it in, just call it How Supernovae Work. Um, and uh, there's plenty of other stuff that's really interesting all over the internet to read about it. And since I said that, like I said, it's time for listener mail. Uh, yeah, I watched, some, I watched some cool kid videos on YouTube. Uh, they're they're always just very instructive. I know we say it a lot, but if you mm -hmm. haven't caught it in the past, if there are difficult scientific concepts for you to understand as an adult or if you're a kid, they, these kids' websites, they break it down like a, adult websites should. Mm -hmm. You know, they really do it right. It's good they stuff. They really do. Um, all right. I'm going to call this. Uh, apparently, we're, we've been patronizing for a long time about the Dark Ages. Uh, we've been called out about this before. Have we really? Yeah, we just never corrected. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to do it again. Okay. Uh, this is from Greg. I know you get a lot of emails, so you'll probably never even read this. <laughs> um, I also know Josh hates correction emails. That's not true not at all, true. Greg. Uh, but for the love of God, could you stop referring to the medieval era as the Dark Ages? 
as you did in your latest Maya episode. It's an outdated Victorian concept that implies medieval people were stupid and ignorant, and that nothing happened for several hundred years until the Renaissance magically appeared. Uh, it's patronizing and devalues the progress made because of great medieval thinkers, as well as supposing that the everyday person between the 10th and 15th centuries was a moron who bungled through life with no meaningful contribution. Mm -hmm. I would hope that uh, your years of research into our progress as a species would have shown that this is not how people evolved. So if you could stop using such an insulting term for a significant period of human history, it would benefit all concerned. And that is from Greg. And uh, for me, Greg, I just say Dark Ages because people know what we're generally talking about yeah. as far as an era goes. I, I never mean that nothing good came from the Dark Ages, but I don't know. Maybe maybe I should rethink even saying that. I don't know. I, I think Greg's beef is with society in general, and he's really picking in, on us and taking it out on us because it's exactly like you said, that we're, we're using that so people know what we're talking about. That's like saying, can you please stop saying enlightenment? Like everything they did was so great. There were, <laughs> exactly. there were plenty of morons in the enlightenment That's right. <laughs> that aren't getting their due. Nice work, Chuck. Man, right. you just picked Greg up, put him in a health <laughs> Nelson, and body slammed him. No, Greg, I hug you. <laughs> we're going to get another email from Greg for this one. If you want to be like Greg and call us out about something that really gets under your skin, stuck in your craw, uh, gums in your hair, that kind of thing, uh, you can email to us at stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.